Good afternoon. Welcome to today's special presentation on the Heart Mountain Prisoner Camp. We apologize, we had a few technical issues, but we think we've got those all ironed out. We, we appreciate uh, your patience and we, we, we're see you, seeing all of you logging in and, and that's great. My name is Rob Black. I'll be moderating today's event, at least a portion of it. Felicia Peterson will be joining me as well. I am the social studies consultant with the Wyoming Department of Education and uh, Felicia assists a lot of our duties here in the, in the education department. I see we have dozens of schools across Wyoming represented today. It, and we also have some uh, libraries and museums joining us, folks from Pennsylvania, North Carolina, Virginia, Georgia. Uh, would like to send out a warm Wyoming welcome to you all. A uh, quick reminder about our format. We're in a Zoom meeting format, but your microphones have been muted to reduce possible noise. Uh, so feel free to put any questions you have in the chat box at any time today during uh, the presentation or, or right afterwards when, uh, when we have our presenter uh, answer questions. So our guest will speak for about an hour, then around 2.30 or so, uh, Felicia will read questions from your chat box and we'll try to get to as many as possible before our presentation ends around 2.45. And if you'd like to add your school or organization's name in the chat along with your question, then we can give you a shout out as well. So let's get started. Our guest speaker, Sam Mihara, is a national lecturer on the topic of mass imprisonment in the United States. In 1942, the US government forced Sam, then nine years old, and his family, along with everyone of Japanese ancestry living in the Western US, out of their homes and into prison camps. Sam and his family were sent to a prison camp called Heart Mountain in desolate Northern Wyoming. The entire family lived in, a one, in one small room without facilities for three years. After returning home, Sam graduated from the Lick Wilmerding High School, the University of Cal Berkeley and the UCLA Graduate School with engineering degrees. He spent his career working at the Boeing Company as a rocket scientist. Since his retirement, Sam has been a sought after guest speaker across the country. On April 20th, 2018, Sam was awarded the National Paul A. Gano Prize as the History Teacher of the Year, the first for a Japanese American and the first from any state west of the Mississippi. He lectures every year at UCLA. He's also spoken at several leading universities, including Harvard, Columbia, Yale, and Georgetown. In February, 2019, Sam spoke at Congress. As of this year, 2021, he has already spoken to over 60,000 students, teachers, attorneys, and seniors. In his compelling presentation, Sam talks about why the World War II camps were created and describes the forced removal of people from their homes. He'll explore what happened to people who challenged the government's violation of their civil rights. And Sam will discuss what daily life in camp was like, how they got out of the camp, and what it was like for many people when they returned home. In Sam's latest work, he visited several detention facilities for undocumented immigrants. His findings are compared to conditions at the World War II camps and summarized in his talk. Finally, Sam examines the question, could mass imprisonment happen again? Please welcome Sam Mihara. Thank you very much, uh, Rob. I appreciate uh, your inviting me to speak today. Let me do a real quick test. Can everyone wave their hand if you can hear me? We had a little audio problem. Where you, oh, I see lots of waving hands. Oh, okay, as long as you can hear me, that's fine. I'm gonna quickly go to the share screen and we can get our program going here very momentarily. You should see my uh, file and we'll go to the slideshow and get on with the PowerPoint program. Uh, okay. Oops. Not responding. Wait one. Oh, wrong button. Sorry about that. Okay. Is um, my first slide should be up. Okay. Thank you very, very much uh, for participating. This is a this is a history story, but it's really a personal story because I've learned over the years. Uh, people tend to remember if I can tell them all kinds of stuff that happened to me and and uh, try to point out that. Uh, Many of those happened to a lot of us uh, during the awful days uh, during World War II. Um, so let me begin with this slide, which is um, a political cartoon from way back in the 1800s 
Uh, here's a uh, an Asian carrying a all kinds of stuff. I'm sorry. Uh, can everybody okay? Can you hear me? Okay. This is, uh, and uh, you see my slide with Asian with a bloody knife in his mouth and his smoking gun standing over this woman he's he just killed. And the captions are yellow terror. Yellow means uh, Asians. Yellow terror threatens white women. So we are dangerous. That's kind of a message that came across. And, and, uh, and that kind of a, a, a point was made in, in the media and a lot of people saw that. Let me introduce you to my family. That that uh, I, I I call him a, a the brat with the folded arms. Uh, that's me. I was uh, uh, about uh, seven years old in the picture. Um, that's my brother next to me, and behind me is my father standing to the right of my mother, and seated are my my grandparents, uh, Grandpa and Grandma Mihara. Uh, the elder Miharas are. Uh, were born in Japan, and they're the original immigrants. They're the ones who came across the, the Pacific, and um, and my father began um, a business which uh, he was trained for. He actually employed by a newspaper company because he was very good in English, and of course he's good in Japanese, and so he became a writer. And he met my mother, and they got married, and as a, result, as a result, my brother and I were born in San Francisco. We are therefore American citizens by birth. Uh, and we're called Nisei. Ni comes to the word ni, which is number two in Japanese. So we are the second generation. Uh, my parents uh, were uh, first generation, so we call them Isei. E comes from the number one in Japanese. So that's the num numerical system we use to identify who we are. After Pearl Harbor, life became very difficult for us and we started seeing these kinds of political cartoons. Here's a Japanese with a bloody knife and on the right side, you see this Nazi, a German soldier carrying his weapon and they're both encroaching over the continental United States. The caption says, our homes are in danger. And what that really means is it's the people who are living in the US who are of Japanese or German ancestry who are dangerous during the World War II. Here's a political cartoon, which is the most ridiculous of all. Uh, starting from the state of Washington in the coast, there's a stream of Japanese people starting to build up and march toward the south. And they pick up more people in Oregon, Northern California. They finally come to Southern California to a station which is housing boxes of nitroglycerin or TNT. And there's a spotter on top of the roof watching for a signal from the enemy ship that says, you know, now's the time, hand it out. So the instructions are given to each person getting a box of TNT, go out and destroy the defense installations in Southern California. You know, it's, it's clear that this cartoonist made the faces look all Japanese. And that's, that's the message. And no, notice the, the artist of this drawing, Dr. Seuss, the, the children's artist, and he made more of these. So, Again, the, the media, the newspaper, through the use of political cartoons and, and other methods have, have been the cause of the problem that was happening during uh, early World War II. You may recognize this photograph. It's a lady and a picture taken by Dorothea Lang. She's a professional photographer on the right side. And she, she was hired by the government to go out to the uh, farm country in California during the Great Depression. And, and she was told to take pictures of people that shows the impact of the Great Depression. And she was really good. This photo became famous because it shows this family who had trouble getting money to put food on the table for her family. And you don't need, the, you know, a caption. You can just look at the photo and tell. And that was a skill that she had, taking pictures of people. So when World War II began, the government said, Dorothea, we want you to go to San Francisco. 
and start taking pictures of Japanese people in the process of our removing them from homes and placing them into prison. But the important requirement, they told Dorothea, don't take bad pictures. Don't make it look embarrassing and, and bad for the government. Take nice pictures that we're removing them very kindly. Well, it turns out Dorothea doesn't take orders. I mean, she's the master of her camera. She takes pictures she thinks that will be important. And you're gonna see some in a moment that turned out to be, you know, in my opinion, spectacular. It was a great, great series of shots to show what she really thought about the people. The first picture she took, she went to the grammar school where I went, which is, which is about two blocks from my house. And she started taking pictures of the kids in the grammar school ground before the classes begin. And I, this is a group of kids who were in my class. There was a, a, a second graders uh, and uh, all these kids are, are uh, good. Uh, I shouldn't say all of them. A lot of them are good friends of mine. The one that has a striped t-shirt, uh, he went by the name of Katsutoshi, I'm sorry, Hisashi Kobayashi. Now Hisashi Kobayashi is not easy to pronounce by people who don't speak Japanese. And you can tell a lot of my classmates are Japanese. So as a result, he, he identified himself with a much easier name, which happens to be Kobe. Kobe, like the basketball player. And so uh, Kobe uh, became good, you know, good friends of mine. And, and uh, I'm going to talk a little bit later about Kobe. But uh, the point I want to make is uh, that's how we solve the language problem by adopting names that are easier to pronounce. Here's another group of pictures. Uh, here's a picture of, uh, so, uh, again, my, my classmates. In the second row, those are Japanese fellows. In the middle in the middle of the second row, there's a guy named Katsutoshi Ito. Now, Ito is like, like Smith and Jones. Uh, uh, it's very common uh, and no problem with pronouncing Ito, but Katsutoshi is a very difficult to pronounce. So his father said, oh, that was a mistake. I shouldn't have done that. So he renamed him Willie. He's been known as Willie Ito. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about Willie. He turned out to be something else. Uh, uh, you won't believe the story about Willie. But anyway, the most uh, important photograph was this one right here, that Dorothea took. It's a group of um, uh, 10, yeah, there were 10-year-old you know, uh, no, seven-year-old, these are younger, seven-year-old second graders, and they're doing their morning Pledge of Allegiance. And what's important is look at the faces of all these kids. You can see that emotion when they recite the Pledge of Allegiance, you know, I pledge allegiance. They, you can see that they're, they're focusing on it, their, their intent, and you can see their loyalty is being expressed when they give the pledge. And that's what made that picture, you know, very famous, used in magazines and, and exhibits and, and, uh, and other uh, places uh, to symbolize the people of Japanese ancestry, where a lot of us were raised in, in the U.S. and were taught American values. Now, all of you know, all of you who recite the pledge know that there's an important phrase with liberty and justice for all. When an armed military guard comes and removes you from your house and puts you in a prison without any accusation, without a hearing, without a jury trial, you are denied the most important requirement under the Constitution. You lost liberty and you lost justice and it was taken away from you. And that's the real complaint that we had after this is all over. And I'm gonna come back to that point in a moment. Dorothy kept snapping more pictures. Here's a headline she caught, ouster, getting of all, getting, no, uh, getting rid of, removing all JAPS in California is near. Now I have to pause for a moment. The abbreviation for the proper word Japanese, I call it the J word. We hate it because of how it was used during the war labeling us as an enemy and, and making life difficult. And, and so I simply say to people, um, 
think about it is, is comparable to the misuse of the N word. That's how strong we feel. So I tell the teachers, please be sure to teach your students uh, to be careful in your, your spoken language. Uh, but uh, I'm telling you as a historian, I wanna show you evidence of how we were treated and that's what's important here. Here is a billboard, a huge billboard that went up a half a block from my house with a phrase, bye bye, in the J word. Now, how would you like it if somebody put up a billboard half a block from your house that says bye bye, whatever your race or religious group or, you know, uh, whatever your background is, wouldn't that be awful? But that's, that's exactly what happened. That's the hate that existed at the time against the people of Japanese ancestry. President Roosevelt made many good decisions. I don't, you know, I don't question his ability to lead the country, but he made one mistake, a huge mistake, on the question of what to do about the Japanese, Germans, and Italians in this country. He listened to some of his advisors who were the military advisors. They recommended that President Roosevelt sign an executive order. And that order simply states, I, the president, am giving the authority to remove people, any people. And that is signature that any of the military people can now uh, have the authority. So he delegated the authority to remove to the military, the local military, and he signed it on executive Executive Order 9066 was signed on February 19, 1942, and that gave the authority. Well, who are these military executives, leaders who have the authority? The United States in 1942 had five districts or commands. In the East, there was a Lieutenant General Hugh Drum, and Hugh Drum had a huge problem. He had lots of Italians and lots of Germans and a few Japanese living up on the East Coast. But he did not remove any of the families. There are two reasons. Number one, the industry said, don't do that because I'm gonna lose my workers and we need workers during the war. But more importantly, General Drum, he was not a racist. He didn't want to identify any particular race to be removed, so he didn't. Out in the Pacific, there's a Lieutenant General De Los Emmons. General Emmons is in charge of Hawaii. In Hawaii, there was a huge problem. 40% of Hawaii were Japanese. And so there were two problems. Number one, I you know, the industry said, don't do that. The pineapple and the sugar industry said, I'm gonna lose my workers. 40% is a huge number, so don't do that. But more importantly, General Emmons, he knew better. He said, that is unconstitutional. I cannot remove a race because it says in the constitution, you can't do that. So he did not. On the other hand, General DeWitt is in charge of the Pacific area, the Western Defense Command. Turns out he had no problem. He hated the Japanese. He hated Japanese of any type. He hated German. I mean, he didn't hate Germans and Italians, but only the Japanese. In fact, he defined who is a Japanese. He said, if anyone is at least partial Japanese, one sixteenth blood Japanese, now that is if, if you had a great, great grandparent, one of them was Japanese and the rest of them were not. He said, you are still Japanese and you will go to the prison. That's how, that's how mean he was. But most important, he found kids who were part Japanese. And let me show you the next picture. This is really alarming. All these kids are part Japanese. You can see it in their faces. There's a little bit of a mix of non-Japanese in them. General DeWitt found them in orphanages because it was popular to place partial uh, mixed race kids into orphanages in California, Oregon, Washington. And he ordered them who had part Japanese into a prison. This picture was taken in a prison camp in the eastern slopes of, of California called Manzanar. 
Look on the third row. These are babies held by Japanese guardians. General DeWitt said, I don't care what their age is. They're all capable of espionage and sabotage, and I want them removed and placed into prison. Today, if you went to Manzanar, you will be able to see the prison within the prison where they held these children. Isn't that awful? But that's the situation that we had. One person had that amount of hate and caused a miserable problem for 120,000 people of Japanese ancestry. So Dorothea kept on busy taking more photographs. She took this one of the signs in front of our homes on lamp posts and walls. And it was uh, uh, clearly stated that we shall show up at a certain location. He, General DeWitt signed it and he said, you have one week to get ready. You can carry one bag and the rest of the things you have to store and put away. And life became very difficult with that order going out. If you violated that rule, you're violating the law. That's how strong of an uh, authority that he had. Dorothy took more pictures. This is a family in Northern California who um, getting ready for the move. And now the children are wearing dog tags. Every tag has their name and their prisoner number. I remember my tag, it had my name and my prisoner number. And make sure that we get on the right bus and get on to the right camp in the right prison. The guards were watching to make sure we get on the prison, hey, on, the, uh, on the bus, and we were first on the bus and taken to a temporary prison. It was called uh, an assembly center. And what they were were typically uh, horse racetracks, but the government closed it down and made prisons out of the horse racetracks, and they surrounded it with barbed wire and guard towers and and soldiers with machine guns and make sure we don't escape. And so we were in there for three months, the amount of time it took to build the new camps. But here in the temporary camp, the only facility to sleep was horse stalls. And here's a picture that Dorothea took of the Japanese families living in these smelly horse stalls in, in the fairground and in, in the racetrack area. And when they ran out of rooms in the horse stalls, they built more. And I remember living in one of those temporary shacks right next to the horse stall. The trains came at three months later, and now the soldiers are standing shoulder to shoulder with weapons, making sure we don't escape. And we get on the train, get ready for the long trip. And it took three days and three nights on that train to get to our train's final destination, which is Northern Wyoming. So this train carried about uh, 600 people. And there were several trains that brought many people from the West to the Hart Mountain camp in Wyoming. Not everybody agreed to go. There were three people who complained and they'd hide, they tried to hide and not, not go. One of them is named Fred Kuramatsu. Fred was a Japanese American, second generation, just like me. But he was a little bit older than me and he knew better. What he did was he said, I'm, I'm not gonna go because I know my rights. The, the, the government cannot take me away from my liberty. So what he did was he went to a plastic surgeon and gave the instructions to the surgeon, make me look white. Now on the picture on the left, that was before surgery. After the surgery, the picture on the right is after the doctor finished, he still looks Japanese. I'd ask for my money back, that's awful. And so here's Fred paying all his money to this surgeon. He, he lost all his money and he still looks Japanese. It was a failure, huge failure. Well, it was, he, it turns out he was caught you know, because he still looks Japanese. And he went to trial, found guilty, he went to a prison and went to Supreme, Supreme Court. The Supreme Court says, uh, oh, you are still guilty uh, and uh, you violated the law uh, that's signed by General DeWitt, so you shall go to prison. So it was a, a vote of six to three. A majority ruled in Supreme Court that he had to stay in the prison. Here's a map of all the camps. The dots on the left are those uh, horse racetracks I talked about. 
the stars in the middle of the country are existing prisons and the government identified a few of the Japanese as dangerous and placed those mostly men, very few women, and placed those dangerous Japanese men in those existing prisons. But the majority of us were, uh, had to go someplace and they had to build new camps and those are called uh, relocation camps. There were 10 of them. In the middle, you see Heart Mountain, Wyoming. That's uh, in Northern Wyoming. In uh, Idaho, there was one. In Utah, there was one. In, in Colorado, there was one. There are two way out here in, in uh, Arkansas, two in the Southern area of Arizona, and two on the Eastern slopes of California. One is Manzanar, which I just talked about, and the other is called Thule Lake, which is a huge facility. Most of the camps had an average of 10,000 people. Thule Lake had 18,000. So that was the, these are the 10 places where most of us uh, went. Where is Heart Mountain? Well, those of you in Wyoming, you know, certainly know Yellowstone, which is on the upper left. And you probably know the town of Cody, which is about 50 miles east of Yellowstone, uh, which was named after Buffalo Bill Cody. And in 1942, it had about uh, 2,000 people, not very big. If you go northeast of Cody, about 30 miles, you'll see the little town of Powell. And Powell at that time had about 1,000 people. Hart Mountain is the name of the mountain, exactly halfway between Cody and Powell. And that's where the government decided to build this huge camp uh, in Wyoming. Now, I was curious, what did the people of Cody think when they heard we were coming? As a result, I started looking into newspapers about what, uh, what people thought back in 1942. And here's a headline that I found. 10,000 of us are to be interned here. Here is an important word. A casual reader seeing that headline says, oh my God, they're coming to Cody. And that's not right. We're th 15 miles from Cody. That's a long way. It doesn't matter. The people who read it said, oh my God, they're coming. And so hysteria, panic comes over Cody. Now, what's the further evidence of this? Well, I found somebody who remembers. Somebody who remembers because he was living in those days, and his name is Ellen Simpson, a retired senior senator from Wyoming. And the reason Ellen knows because he was a teenager back in World War II. And he remembered what the people of Cody thought when they heard we were coming. And I found this recording of an interview. Let's play it to hear what Ellen remembers about the people of Cody. So then we were told there were 11,000 people there. Well, there are only two cities larger than that in Wyoming. That was Cheyenne and Casper. Powell was about 2,500, Cody probably 3,500. And so people thought, now if those people escape, we'll all be killed. Well, there were 11,000 of them there and they are gonna break out and they'll come to town and we'll be dead. Amazing, people of Cody thought we're gonna come and break out of camp and kill them all, amazing. So here's a plan for the entire camp, 30 blocks, 20, uh, 25 people, I'm sorry, uh, 24 barracks in each block and each barrack aisled about 25 people. There are plans to build three schools, one high school and two grammar schools, but the government stopped building more schools beyond the one high school. And the reason is the local people complained. Now, why are you building new schools for prisoners when we who are not prisoners don't get new schools? As a result, the government stopped building any more schools for people here at Heart Mountain. The government hired 2000 workers, mostly carpenters to come to Heart Mountain and build this camp. And the finished product is shown in this photograph. In the background, you see Heart Mountain. It's kind of shaped like a heart. That's where it's got its name. 
And on the left, you see the 450 barracks that these carpenters built. The outside is covered with tar paper. And on the right side, you see the barbed wire fence that went around the entire camp and the guard tower. There were nine guard towers. And you can see another one on top of this hill. So all around the perimeter of the camp, there are these guard towers. And I remember the soldiers inside the tower with weapons, make sure we don't escape. When we got there, the train stopped and let us off at a siding and we're carrying our hand carry. They loaded us on trucks, army trucks, and took us into the camp. When we got into the camp, the government gave each of us two numbers and we had to memorize these. The first number is my room number or cell number. 14 is the block number, 22 is the barrack, and the letter C is the room or cell where I was in. The second number is my prisoner number, 26737D. And today, there's a file in Washington, D.C. with not only my file, but everyone's file, 120,000 files. And each file has all the paper records of what happened to each of us in the camp. It, it has my medical records, which is important. It also had my, my uh, school report cards. And I'm not gonna let you see those, it was awful. But it's, it's still there uh, as evidence of the, of the bad student I was in those days. But uh, that's how they kept the documents up. The most important photograph, I mean, the slide in my show is this one right here. On the left, you see the guard on top of the guard tower with his weapon, the long range rifle, looks like an M1 pointing in toward the barracks. In the middle, you see the details of the guard tower, the floodlights pointing in, but on the right side, most important, there are signs in English and in Japanese. It says, stop, don't go beyond this point, otherwise you can get shot. That's a definition of a prison. And that's what the clear evidence that the government imprisoned us in this camp, in all of 10 camps. Here's the details of the barrack. There are six rooms in each barrack. They're all identical. On the ends were the smallest rooms that had couples. Next to the ends were larger for the held uh, families, up to seven people. In the middle, or the middle medium sized rooms. And that's where my family of four people lived. When we got in, it was just an empty room with four military type cots or beds, and not much room for anything else. No water, no electricity, except a single light bulb in the ceiling. Here's a picture of my family in front of the barrack. That's me in a white shirt, my brother in a sweater, my mother on the far left, and then her thristers, three sisters, my aunts, in the middle and then my uncle on the right. The toilets were embarrassing. This set of 10 toilets served 300 people and no partitions. Imagine you're sitting on one of these pots and nine others are looking at you and watching you do your business. Isn't that awful? But <laughs> we had no choice. That was the situation for our toilets. The food at the start was not very good. You see on the, on the, on the table, there's a plate of, of, of uh, bread. Uh, there's a saucer of potatoes in front of the kids. Um, the mother is eating some pickled veggies and there are more pickled veggies in the, in the saucers. In the pitcher, there was powdered milk. The problem is that's not the kind of food the Japanese ate in those days. We love fresh veggies. Uh, we like whole milk. We like uh, uh, poultry and eggs, rice and fish. So as a result, the only thing we could do about the problem is raise our own food. And we did just that. The large property between uh, the camp, which is right here in this dark shadow, and the river that came out of Yellowstone, which is the Shoshone River, of all that land was desolate, sagebrush covered, and the farmers in the camp decided to convert all of that into farms. It took a long time of hard work. One year later, we were able to eat the kind of foods 
that uh, we're used to. So that worked out at least a little bit better. The winters were horrible. The first winter, and I don't have to tell this to people who live in Wyoming, but I'm gonna tell it to Californians because if we're not used to that first winter, which was minus 28 degrees. It set a new record for that part of Wyoming. And I'll never, never forget that awful cold weather blowing at 50 miles an hour. And the worst part of it, we didn't know we were coming to Wyoming. They wouldn't tell us. And we were wearing California clothing. The schoolrooms were almost bare bones. Remember I told you they had to convert some of the barracks into schoolrooms. Well, we had a few carpenters who built some benches to use as tables. And that's our grammar school situation at the start. We had a police force made up of all Japanese, all prisoners. The only police force in the country made up of policemen who were prisoners, but we had no choice. They had to maintain order in the camp and that's our police force. We had a hospital, all it was was more barracks and a, and a car corridor connecting the barracks. And uh, our family had real problems. My father became blind in camp. And what happened was uh, he had a case was called glaucoma of the eyes before camp. And he was taken care of by a special doctor who knew how to do that. Once he got to Carp Heart Mountain, there was no one, no one who knew how to take care of his eyes. So he went blind. And General DeWitt would not let him go back to visit his doctor. That was a very real, real hardship on our family. My grandfather had the worst case of all. He died in camp. Here is a funeral picture. We held a funeral inside the barrack. And that's me wearing a white shirt. My father's next to me. My mother, uh, grandma is in the veil uh, on the other side. And I was wondering what happened because inside of a few months, he weathered away to skin and bones. He looked like a Holocaust survivor. And I, I wondered what could happen. I looked at his medical records and the medical records clearly showed that grandpa had a case of cancer, uh, uh, a condition called colon cancer. And the doctors were not specialists in, in that disease. And all they did was they, they tried something experimental they let him starve to keep out whatever problems he had. So he, he rapidly lost a lot of weight. In fact, to make sure he stays clean, they gave him a laxative for colon cancer. It's all on the record. And so that tells you something about the lack of medical care inside these prisons that happened at that time. At the end of our stay, Toward the end of our stay, the government let a few of us go to downtown uh, Cody. And here's a picture of Sheridan Avenue taken around those days. And I remember going up and down Sheridan Avenue, looking on inside each store and showing or describing to my blind father what's inside. And about every third store, I saw this sign, no J people, awful. And that's my lesson that I learned in the Wyoming area about hatred. And I'll never forget that. It was a very, very difficult uh, time for us. At the very, very end, there was an attorney in San Francisco named James Purcell. His specialty is called civil rights. In other words, making sure that every US citizen has his most fundamental civil rights according to the constitution. And he recognized what was going on, the people being removed from their homes, placed into prisons. And he knew that that was not constitutional. So he filed a lawsuit against the US government saying, you can't do that to this one person, a lady that he found named Mitsuo Endo. And it turns out Mitsuo Endo was an American citizen like me and she did exactly everything the government told her to do. I mean, she reported to camp, she didn't complain, she didn't try to escape. And after three years, you know, James Purcell said, that was wrong, that was a mistake. So this lawsuit says, you must, you, the government must let her go. They filed a lawsuit and went to the Supreme Court. And this time the Supreme Court 
unanimously. In other words, a vote of nine to zero. Every Supreme Court justice said, we agree. You got to let her go because her civil rights, her constitutional rights were violated. And that's how she got out. And the government said, all right, let's let the rest of the people go. So her case was very, very important. I found out all over the country, no one who have not heard the story really understands uh, what happened at the very end. So thanks to this fellow James Purcell, what the situation was. So the government decided then to bring back the trains that brought us there. Here we are loading up. The guards were sent home, no guards, and we're now free to go. And the government decided to hide Heart Mountain Camp. They took all 450 barracks, sold them off for $1 a piece and convert the property into farms. And so there was an attempt to simply try to wipe out the existence of Heart Mountain. So those of us who went through this, we're trying to bring the barracks back, recreate the camp that it used to be so people can remember. When we got home, life was really tough because the racial hatred got even worse. And we see signs like this. And there's another one here that said, don't, 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 don't stop here, keep moving. We don't want you here back in your home. So life was really tough. One, one of my friends had an extremely difficult time. Her name is Toshi Ito. And Toshi remembers because her father looked for a job in the business of, of selling insurance. That was his, his profession. And he couldn't find it because of racial hatred. The insurance company would not hire him. I'm gonna let her tell the story, which is, a, as a result, her father committed suicide. Let's let her speak. It happened when Toshi was a newlywed on her honeymoon. She received a call that her father was sick and she needed to come home. She remembers stepping off that train and being told what really happened. I went to his bed and on the side he slept and I just lay there and I cried and I could smell his hair tonic that he wore. And uh, I never cried so much in my life. Very sad. I know Toshi, or I, should, I knew her because she passed away about two years ago. But while she was living, she wanted to get that on film. She wanted the people to know what really happened. And I know of other families, by the way, that had suicides as, as a result of this huge hatred. And they've asked me not to talk about it. It's, it's somewhat embarrassing, but not Toshi. She had the courage. She had the guts to, to do that film. And a lot of people have seen it. We were not happy at the end of all of this. You know, some people said, oh, let's just forget it. And most of us said, no, no, we can't forget it. It was awful. We wanted three things. We wanted our civil rights back. We wanted protection under the constitution. We wanted a written apology. We wanted the government to say that they're sorry that they made this huge mistake in writing. And we wanted some money because we lost a lot of money when a lot of our property was lost or stolen that we had to leave behind. And it took a 50 year time period to convince people, mostly in Washington, in Congress and the White House to do something about this problem. One of the steps in that process was an exhibit at the Smithsonian in Washington, DC. It featured on the outside Dorothea Lange's famous poster girl. And on the inside, there were photographs of Japanese American soldiers who fought for this country, mostly in Europe. And photographs of the families of these soldiers who were put into these prison camps at the same time. Like this photograph that's next. This is the Masuda family the Masudas uh, came from an area real close to my house in California. And the, there's a soldier in the middle with in uniform. His name is Kaz Masuda. He came to say goodbye. And this room is inside the prison camp. And he said goodbye to all these family members. After the picture was taken, he was shipped out to Europe. And he died fighting for this country. 
So this picture was sent to the White House with a message, please, Mr. President, sign the bill that gives us what we want. And here he is, President Ronald Reagan, signing the bill in writing, stating those three things that we wanted. I received a letter two years after that from the first President George Bush. And in that letter, it has the word sincere apology. It came with a check, a, the amount of $20,000 per person who was living at the day when President Reagan signed the bill, which was almost too late because half of the people in 1988, half of the people who were in the prison were gone, you know, like my father and my grandpa. As a result, uh, at least those of us who survived uh, appreciated this. Art Mountain today, beautiful place. Those of you who've been in the area know it's still there and it's a nice place. But those of us who went through this experience wanted to do something and we built a school. It's really called a learning center, but it's, on the outside, it looks like a barracks, 20 feet wide, 120 feet long. And you walk through the main entrance and you go through a series of self-guided school rooms and you become educated on what really happened in more detail than I've been able to talk to you in this short time. We bring in kids from all over. If you haven't been there, talk to your teachers and suggest you have a road trip, a day trip to come to Heart Mountain and tell them Sam sent you and uh, they'll treat you with kid gloves, I'm sure. But this group came not only from, this, this group came from Montana uh, High School and did a day trip. And they learned a lot by seeing the facility and going to the learning center. When we built that uh, school uh, 10 years ago, I went to downtown Cody. There's a picture I took of uh, Sheridan Avenue today. And I looked around and I looked at the windows like I did in 1942. And guess what signs I saw? Every window had this sign. Welcome, Japanese Americans. My goodness, what a change. The people of Cody today, totally different from those who were there in 1942 to 44. Very, very nice of the people there. I wanna close out with a picture of some of my buddies, remember uh, Kobe with a striped t-shirt. Most of my friends went to college and, and um, they wanted to become you know, professionals. Our parents uh, insisted that we, be get, we get a good education Kobe was no different. He went to University of California with me and became a pharmacist. And he did quite well. He's, here's what it looks like more recently. Uh, and uh, other than the hair color change, it's still the same Kobe. Uh, and most of my buddies uh, did similar going into um, uh, medical professions or lawyers or uh, other uh, facilities. Um, my buddy, Willie, Willie was different. I can't explain why, except he had this passion, a passion to become a cartoon artist before the war. And, and so we thought, well, well, Willie, as long as you become the best, I guess it's okay. You don't need a college degree to become the world's best cartoon. So he went to a good art school and he was hired by Walt Disney. And he became a, 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 not only a, an expert uh, animation artist, uh, but he uh, became promoted to positions of higher positions and to help control the quality of the images created by the Disney organization. But one of the things he did along the way, you may not know, is a video, a film called Lady and the Tramp. A lot of you probably have seen it. You remember the scene where the two dogs are sipping this one noodle until their lips met? Ah, that was Willie's creation, and he won uh, the equal, uh, equivalent of an Academy Award for that. So, uh, you know, hats off to Willie. I still see Willie very, very frequently. Oh, what happened to Toshi Ito? Well, she got married, had a family. Here's a family, young boy, Master Ito, turned out to be somebody that some of you may have heard about. His name is Judge Lance Ito of the O.J. Simpson trial. Lance is a good friend of mine. I see him once in a while, uh, but uh, it turns out, yeah, he is the son of the courageous Toshi Ito. 
I was interested in science and math in school. And um, so I went to UC Berkeley, University of California, Berkeley, became an engineer, got my degree. I went to UCLA graduate school to get more specialty. And I was hired by the Boeing company uh, and helped to develop rockets like the one you see here on the right. And it puts up a lot of satellites. So I enjoyed 42 years of a great, great experience. The Boeing company treated me extremely well. Uh, and after I retired, I did something totally different because I heard people want to hear my story. So 10 years ago, I became a lecturer, uh, a national lecturer. I speak now annually at the University of California, schools, uh, libraries, uh, law schools, uh, government offices all over the country. Uh, and I'm enjoying it thoroughly because it's teaching people what really happened. And what happened to the poster girl, that, that famous iconic image from Dorothea Lange fame? Well, she grew up, here's a more recent photo of her. Uh, look at the eyes, they're the same, the nose is the same, that's her. And she changed her name twice. It used to be, the first name used to be Hideno, which is uh, easy to pronounce for Japanese but she adopted the name Helene. The last name used to be Nakamoto, which is another Japanese name, typical. And she changed that to no less than Mihara. We've been married for 65 years and uh, we now have two daughters and uh, two grandkids. Everyone, including the grandkids, have graduated from college. And so uh, we're, we're doing okay. But I wanna conclude with a thought. Why did these prison camps exist? I told you, the first one is racial prejudice. The awful labeling us as somebody undesirable. The second was hysteria. The newspapers, the billboards, the, the hysteria, the fear created by the media was a real problem. But the most important were some leaders some leaders of this country failed to honor the constitution. They ignored it. They simply said, these people cannot be trusted and therefore we must imprison them. And I feel that it could happen again. Take a look at this picture. At one time, remember it was almost Germans. It was almost Italians except for Lieutenant General who said, I'm not going to do that. It was almost, you know, a lot of people. Today, it could be others. It could be Muslim Americans. You know, it could be Middle Easterners. It could be, in fact, it is to some extent, Latinos, immigrants from Central America. And this could be your son looking at an armed guard, wondering, where is he taking me? This could be your daughter inside the prison camp after three years wondering, how am I gonna get out of here? How long is it gonna be? And this might be your son trying to escape by climbing over the fence, not knowing there's a guard with a weapon pointing straight at him. So I simply say, never again to anyone, not to anyone at all. Thank you very much. Uh, those of you interested, uh, please ask your teachers or ask your librarian to order my book, which has a lot of personal details on what happened and these important things that happened along the way. It's available on my website. Anyone who also would like me to get into your school with a more detailed lecture, I'd be happy to do that. But regardless, uh, let me know on my first opening page on the website uh, is a question you can ask let me know what you think. So that's about it, uh, Rob. Uh, I'm wondering, is this the time then to go to Q&A? It certainly is. And, and even though everyone's muted, I think we all, you can probably only hear me clapping, but let's give Sam a big hand. We can, we <laughs> thank can you. see you clapping even if we can't Oh, thank you all. I appreciate it. Thank you. We're, thank you. We're, we're going to give you a standing O, Sam. That was just amazing. What an amazing thank story. Thank you. thank you so much for sharing okay. that with I'm all gonna, of us. I'm going to stop sharing so we can get back to the group. Thank you. And, and oh. I understand 
it sounds like I have a cold. I don't. It sounds like I'm trying to sound like John Wayne. I'm not. So I'm going to have Felicia read some of the questions that we received uh, both through YouTube and I think we might have might have had some in the chat. But uh, Felicia, go ahead. Um, my name is Felicia Peterson. I work with Rob at the WDE. And um, our first question uh, was submitted uh, from someone watching on YouTube. And uh, that question was, um, did anyone ever get injured or shot trying to escape Heart Mountain or other camps that you know of? Oh, I missed the key word. Did, did anyone get what again? Uh, injured or shot. Oh, injured or shot. Uh, there's an interesting story. At Heart Mountain, oh, let me put it the other way. At the other camps, there were seven killings caused by guards, and none of the prisoners were trying to escape. They were trigger-happy guards. And at Heart Mountain, no one was shot. I never heard a shot in the three years I was there. Fortunately, fortunately, we didn't have that problem. But it did happen at the other camps. And so the uh, point is it could happen again. Yeah. Next question. Uh, let's see. With all the anti-Asian violence mm -hmm. being reported around the US, what is your reaction to that? And do you have any ideas on how to stop it? That is a very good current question. And you know, it really, really bothers me to see in, t in today's age, uh, videos of actual uh, injuries happening to, to people of Asian ancestry. It really happened significantly when the prior administration, a few of the people started using terms that labels the pandemic as being caused by people of Asian uh, ancestry. When they use terms like the, the Chinese flu or Kung flu or other derogatory names, the statistics show the number of complaints rapidly, rapidly went up after that point. There were over 3,000 complaints of people having harassment, harassed or injured by people. It just happened yesterday, uh, more people uh, were, were uh, injured. Um, and in my opinion, there are two reasons. Number one is people who use the phrase to characterize uh, the problem, the virus. The second problem is education. People committing these crimes clearly don't have the proper education that we as American citizens don't deserve that kind of treatment. And my solution is very simple. Stop using these terms. Give it the correct name, the scientific name, COVID-19. What's wrong with that? That's accurate. It doesn't doesn't name a, a, a nationality or, or a race or, or a religion. Give it the scientific name and the problem should start diminishing and going away. But uh, hopefully they'll solve the problem and um, it, it, life is, is extremely difficult. Uh, and I hope, I hope we can solve it uh, fairly quickly. Next question, please. Right. Um, <clears throat> at what age, approximately, did you realize the gravity of what was happening to you and your family and others of Japanese descent? Well, it, it happened in stages. I mean, um, when we saw the headlines on December the 7th, you know, we knew something was awful and something could be very serious. Uh, before General DeWitt uh, you know, took the action, my father knew that we're in trouble because in, in those days, my, my parents who were Japanese uh, immigrants uh, were not citizens. Uh, in fact, uh, people of Japanese ancestry were denied the ability to apply for citizenship. 
due to a law way back before they they were born. But uh, and now you know they're facing they're living in a country uh, not of their nationality and and they might be forced away, and they maybe have to forced to go back to Japan and leave the kids here. So they were very concerned. But uh, when I saw the the move order, I, I knew something was going to go and. And uh, I knew that, you know, they wouldn't tell us where we were going. That made it even more difficult. What are we, you know, what are, where are we supposed to go? How do we get ready for wh where we were going? Um, but once we got on the train and once we got to Heart Mountain, we knew, it, you know, in those days, there was no farms around when we arrived. It was a desolate country, sagebrush covered, um, wondering, my God, where, where are we going? And this is awful. And then we saw the barracks and the barbed bar wire fence, and we knew we we're going to go into a prison. All of that you know, took a, took some time to soak in, but it wasn't very long uh, that um, we knew we were in for a problem. Next question. So we have a question in the chat um, from a classroom. What brought Japanese people to Wyoming? Um, was it trains, cars? You mean the Japanese people who were the prisoners or Japanese people who were living in Wyoming? There are two types. I, I think it's the ones who were living in internment. Um, so I'm sorry, the question is what? How were the Japanese prisoners brought to Wyoming? Oh, how were they? Okay. Well, I think you saw the picture of the train. Uh, each train had 600 people average and that's how we came. There were several trains. The, the buses weren't big enough to hold so many people. So with you know 600 people per train, lots of trains came and that's how we came uh, to Heart Mountain, oh, Wyoming. Okay. Um, oh, we have quite a few questions coming in now. Um, when were the signs that said no and the J word taken down? Uh, well, uh, at, uh, at home, right after the war, we started seeing, you know, some degree of, uh, of uh, calmness come over the uh, area. Uh, I don't know uh, in Cody what happened. I suspect as soon as they found we were gone, there was no need for such signs, and they probably took it down right after that. Because no one stayed, not a single per, not a not a single person of ten thousand stayed at Heart Mountain area. You know, there was one farm, uh, have which had Japanese uh, farmers uh, near Paul, um, and um, and of course that's their home, and they they've stayed for for quite a while. But uh, no, everyone else went back home. Okay, um, our next question I think is from DC. Um, what was your mindset while in the camp? What was my mindset while in the camp? Yes. Uh, well, uh, I was pretty much resigned to, you know, it wasn't try to escape because it was a long way home and we had no way to get home. Uh, so we just resigned ourselves to doing what we can and, um, uh, we spent you know, a fair amount of time going to school, uh, but when we were not in school, uh, that's where a lot of problems came up because uh, young kids, if they're not properly supervised, uh, they can get in trouble. And uh, I remember I got in trouble. A lot of other of my friends did too. Uh, so um, I'll, I'll give you one episode. Uh, we got tired of trying to collect arrowheads and, and um, bugs like scorpions in the camp and we wanted to try to get out of camp and so we would uh, when the guards weren't looking we would break through the barbed wire fence and go down to Shoshone River for a swim always coming back though before the end of the day um, there was also things like uh, collecting rattlesnakes or at least cutting off their tails and having a contest of how many rattle tails can you gather in a certain time. Uh, some kids started a little zoo uh, in their barracks. They collected uh, scorpions and other uh, wildlife in the area. But uh, no, to be honest with you, um, 
it was not easy you know, life in the camp. And some of it is uh, I describe in my book. Yeah. And we want to respect uh, uh, the time of the classes. So Felicia, maybe one more and then we'll wrap up. Okay. Um, <clears throat> all right, so final question. What can the youth of today do to protect the liberties of themselves and others in an era where racism, religion, and politics remain big problems? That is a really well put question, very thoughtful question by somebody. And I've been asked that question before. Uh, typically the question reads, uh, you know, I'm only a high school student. You know, what, a guy, what am I gonna do to solve this worldly problem uh, that we have today? And my answer is I looked at the fellow in the face who asked the question, I said, you can do a lot. For one thing, you can get ready by making a decision to do things that'll help. Uh, when, when, if you're underage, go ahead and prepare. Think about getting ready for your chance to now vote for the leader. So you can make the proper decision. Better yet, you can become a leader yourself and you make the decision that you think is very humane and civil and constitutional. Uh, even at your age, you can do things now. You can go out and voice your opinions. And a lot of young people have joined adults and talk about, you know, things that are wrong that need correction. And it's worked well in some cases. Uh, for example, uh, when, when the uh, women's movement took place several years ago, you know, many people, many people joined ranks and, um, and had a movement to try to demonstrate that women have certain rights and they should be maintained. And the, you know, the Supreme Court listened to them. Now here's a case where a public opinion was so strong that the Supreme Court made a decision in their favor. So that's what you can do. You can speak up and uh, then get ready to become a leader on your own. So thanks for the question and thanks for a great session. Rob? Oh, Sam, that was wonderful. Thank you so much. I'd like to thank all of our, our students, teachers, and, and mm -hmm. museum and library folks. Uh, be sure to go to Sam's website, sammihara.com. Pick up his book, have your library get that book or, 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 or see if you can pick it up somewhere. A, a quick plug, Sam will be back with us on August 13th, Friday the 13th. We hope that's a, a lucky day, not an unlucky day, uh, as part of our Native American Education Conference. And we will, we will uh, get information out to our, our schools uh, so uh, students and teachers can join that. Uh, that is for both adults and youth. And that'll be about one o'clock Mountain Time on August 13th uh, during the Native American Education Conference. So we'll welcome you back, Sam. We can't wait to have you back and, and talking to us again. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. And thank you, everyone, for joining, and especially helped by Felicia and Paula and others make this a success. Thank you. I appreciate it much. You bet. Thank and you. that'll do it. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.